Hello, hi, I'm very, very happy. Good evening. So this is Krishna Veni, and we've been talking about the story of life on Earth, and that's biology. So welcome to my new beginning series. So it's great to see you all uh, on this uh, uh, Thursday evening. So, so hello, Bhavya. Yes, a very, very happy good evening. Hello, Supriya. Very, very happy good evening. So thank you so much for joining with me for this lecture. So wishing you all a very, very happy Dashara in advance. So may this bring a lot of. Uh, good vibes a lot of happiness a lot of good health and wealth a lot of wisdom a lot of knowledge which is equally important to your family and you so may you reach good heights that is my dashara wishes for you so i hope all of you are doing really great so we are also doing really great because we are very quick in our journey so i guess very soon we will reach our destination so looking at how time flies i'm really surprised at how quickly it is flying well, so today we are almost in the third lecture or you can say the third topic of this chapter, excretory substance and their elimination. So we are done talking about the structure of the human kidney. So yesterday we spoke about the mechanis mechanism for the formation of urine. So today we are here to talk about how the urine is concentrated. So why should the urine be concentrated? So that is the next question. Uh, so your kidney forms urine, right? So now... If you do not drink enough water in a day, so your kidney has the responsibility to save the body from the water crisis. So in that case, your kidney cannot let go uh, all the water through the urine. So the kidney has to save or restore or conserve the water, right? So in that case, your kidney has to conserve water. So it has to concentrate the urine. So how it is do doing and what, what comes into the aid? So who is exactly the main player here? So we are going to talk about all that today. So again, it's going to be a pretty short lecture. So uh, our lecture will maximum extend up to 24 minutes or 26 minutes. And not more than that, right? Uh, yes, Dashara, uh, sorry. Yes, Bhavya, so thank you for your Dashara wishes. Fine. So without any further delay, let's move forward. So let's talk about the mechanism of concentration of urine. So before we talk about the mechanism of concentration of urine, so I hope you remember the structure of the human kidney. I just want to show you this picture. So that is why I have got this. Uh, so this is the kidney structure right so we have uh, the renal cortex we have the renal medulla so this region so this funnel shaped structure is the renal pelvis so i can say this is the renal pelvis right and these structures are the calluses so i am highlighting this portion and the nephron is here so this is the cortex and this is the medulla of the nephron so when the loop of Henle extends here, we call it as a juxta medullary nephron. And if it does not, it is called as the cortical nephron, right? So I just want to clarify. I just want to show you the magnified version of this image. So that is the reason I got it here. So this is the structure of the kidney. So if you have any doubt as to how it is integrately arranged inside the structure of the kidney, so I have it here. So please have a glance so that you never get confused. So you can see these tubes, tubes right? So this is the hilum region right and you have structures like this which runs around uh, runs around the medullary pyramid so that is the column of Bertney it runs around like this fine so this is the structure of kidney so I wanted to show you the proper picture so I want to make sure that your analysis your imagination is right so that is how it is so you can imagine a movie up to whichever extent you want because your imagination has low limit but when we are talking about an already discovered thing, so you have to limit your imagination to how it is, right? That is the reason I want to show you the picture. So now coming to the me uh, for mechanism of formation of urine. So we spoke about three steps yesterday. So I hope you remember the three steps in the formation of urine. So how is the formation of urine taking place? So our heart pumps, so the cardiac output is 5000 ml or 5 liters, right? So this is the amount of blood your heart pumps, say your ventricle pumps. So out of this, one-fifth of the uh, blood from the heart enters the kidney. So this blood has to be filtered for the waste substance and thus your kidney produces urine. So this happens in three steps. So the first step is glomerular filtration. The second step is tubular reabsorption. And the third one is tubular secretion. 
So these are the three steps that takes uh, part in the or this, these are the three steps that is involved in the process of urine formation. So now how does glomerular filtration work? So you have the network of capillaries that is the glomerulus which is enclosed by a cup shaped capsule that is the Bowman's capsule. Right. So, what brings in the blood vessels? That is the afferent arteriole. So, what takes the blood outside? So, that is the efferent arteriole. So, this is the glomerulus and this is the Bowman's capsule and together it is called as the Malpighian tubule. Right. So, now when we talk about filtration, so which are the regions that is involved in filtration? So, number one, we have the endothelium of the uh, glomerulus. So, the epithelial which lines the blood vessel is known as endothelium. So, we can say endothelium of the glomerulus. So, number two, we have the epithelium of the Bowman's capsule. So, the epithelium of the Bowman's capsule is known as podocytes. So, number three, in between these two, we have a basement membrane. So, that also plays a very important role. Right? So, we are ultimately going to filter blood here. So, blood has two components. One is formed elements, the other one is plasma. And the plasma is the liquid portion of the blood. So, of course, the formed elements will not be filtered. But even the plasma, which has the plasma proteins, are not filtered out. So, the filtration is very, very accurate and precise and you can say exact. So, the filtration is also known as ultrafiltration. That is because the podocytes have your filtration slits at a proper interval. So, they have filtration slits. So, that is the reason it is known as ultrafiltration. So, what the filtrate that comes out of the glomerulus is called as the glomerular filtrate and there's a particular volume that has to be filtered in a particular time. So, we call that as the glomerular filtration rate. So, the glomerular filtration rate is 125 ml per day, sorry, per minute. So, it is 180 liters per day. So, if this falls below normal, so you know you have JGA cells that is Juxta glomerular apparatus. It is present at the junction between your efferent arteriole and it is also between the DCT. So, it is between the afferent and the DCT. So, your JGA cell activates what is known as your angiotensinogen. Into angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 2. Which in turn activates or which in turn produces or turns on a protein known as renin. R-E-N-I-N, R-E-N-N-I-N comes in your digestion, right? So, this increases the pressure and decreases the volume. So, this is in a way a vasoconstrictor. Because when I say the glomerular filtration rate is less, so I mean to say the pressure is less and the volume is more. So it is converting it into the vice versa way. So with this, we are done with the process of glomerular filtration. Hi, Dharni. Yes, a very, very happy good evening. So thank you for joining my lecture today. Yes, happy Ayudha Bucha. Yes, wishing you the same. Uh, so thank you for joining my lecture once again. And please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. So, please lend us your support. So, share the link of my class with your friends, your neighbors, your uh, juniors, seniors. It does not matter. So, as long as they are preparing and they want to learn, I am ready to teach. So, please let them know. Fine. So, this is how the first step works. So, the second step is tubular reabsorption. So, uh, in a day, your kidney is capable of producing or filtering 180 liters of blood. But we excrete only 1 to 1.5 liters of urine, so which means 99% where it goes. So, 99% is getting reabsorbed. So, from where to where it is getting reabsorbed. So, reabsorption happens from the glomerular filtrate into the tubules, into the renal tubules. So, your PCT, your loop of Henle, your DCT. And the collecting duct reabsorb all the essential nutrients. Fine. Uh, so, this is getting reabsorbed. So, like your sodium, your glucose, your amino acid, your water. So, everything is getting reabsorbed. 
So water is getting reabsorbed by osmosis. So you can say glucose and amino acid by active transport which needs ATP, right? And the last step is tubular secretion. So now that the uh, renal tubule starts feeling guilty because we have taken everything from the filtrate, now we have to give something back. So now the filtrate uh, is going to give, so the renal tubule is going to give something to the filtrate. So secretion happens from the renal tubule to the filtrate. So what do they secrete? They secrete Na plus, K plus, so sorry, they do not secrete Na plus, they secrete K plus, H plus and ammonia into the filtrate to maintain the ionic balance that has to be maintained in the filtrate. So these are the three stages of formation of urine. So the process of release of urine is called as mictrusion, which we'll be discussing tomorrow. But today, even before that, so we have to do something more important. So we have to see what are the functions of these four. So generally, I told you they help in reabsorption. But how exactly? So we are going to talk. Okay, so we are going to talk about the reabsorption. So we are exactly going to talk how these tubes are going to help in reabsorption and then we will go into the point of how your kidney is concentrating the urine, fine. So let us move forward. So, functions of the tubules, that is our next topic. So, first we are going to start with PCT. So, PCT, you know, PCT stands for, so I guess I have the term. So, proximal convoluted tubule, so I do not have to write, right. So, PCT is highly coiled, so that is why it is called as convolution. So, whenever you have coils, whenever you have foldings in your cell or inside your body, that is to increase the surface area of absorption, right? So, why are your uh, bristles made up of a lot of uh, surface area? So, why it is like a brush border structure? So, why is your paint brush have such an appearance? Why can't it be completely flat? So that is because to enhance the absorption surface, right? So when you take a paint in your brush, so the aim of the brush or the appearance of the brush is to enhance more amount of paint comes in the brush, right? So much in the same way, so whenever there is a coil, so this is convoluted, meaning it is highly coiled so that it can reabsorb to a maximum extent. So your microvilli, so that is also, it just has finger-like projections, so that is again to increase the surface area of absorption, right? So that is PCT, so this also has maximum convolutions. So maximum reabsorption happens here. So 90% of the essential nutrients are reabsorbed here. Like what? So like glucose, like sodium, like water, like amino acids. So everything is reabsorbed in your PCT. So your PCT also has brush border epithelial appearance. So it has a brush border appearance. So this brush border appearance is given by cuboidal epithelium. So, epithelium is a separate tissue system. So, that gives the brush border appearance. So, apart from this helping in reabsorption, this also plays a role in tubular secretion. Yes, it also secretes your K plus uh, ammonia and it also secretes your H plus into the filtrate. So, yes, your PCT plays a role in uh, your uh, uh, reabsorption as well as secretion. So, is my video clear to everyone? Because on my screen, it is a bit blurred. So, is it clear for you guys? Is my video clear? Yes, Shubham sir. Hello. So, thank you for joining with us today. So, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. So, that is the function of PCT. So, it helps in maximum reabsorption. It also helps in um, a secretion to the filtrate as well. Fine. So, moving further. So, the next one is we are going to talk about the loop of Henle. Yes, thank you, Supriya. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for the re response. So, the next one is we are going to talk about the loop of Henle. So, this is your loop of Henle. So, it is a hairpin like structure. So, here the filtrate is going to come down and here the filtrate is going to move up. So, that is how it is going to flow, right? So, since it is coming down, so this is the descending limb.
right? And this is the ascending limb because it is going up. So now let's talk about the descending limb first and then we'll talk about the ascending limb, right? So first we are going to talk about the descending limb. So the descending limb of Henle or the descending loop of Henle. So this region is permeable to water. But it is impermeable to electrolytes. Fine. So, which means when my filtrate is moving inside the descending limb of Henle, so whatever limited water is there, it will move out. Because this tube is permeable to water, so whatever little water, so after PCT maximum is reabsorbed. So, whatever is remaining, so that water will move out. So, only electrolytes will be present. So, by the time the filtrate comes here, it is concentrated. Right? Okay. So, this is about the descending limb. So, now talking about the ascending limb of Henle. So, this is the ascending limb, right? So, the ascending limb or the loop of Henle is exactly different to the descending limb. So, this loop is permeable to electrolytes. And it is impermeable to water. So now the concentrated filtrate is moving up. So now this wall being permeable to electrolytes, the electrolytes move out. So now the remaining water is left inside. So the filtrate here becomes diluted. So the filtrate after passing through the loop of Henle, that is the descending loop, it gets concentrated and after passing through the ascending limb, it gets diluted. So that is the correlation between these two. So this is the function of the loop of Henle, fine. So now moving to the next one, that is the DCT. So DCT is distal convoluted tubule. So it helps in conditional reabsorption. When everything is done, right? So you have given your test paper, you have checked it before uh, submitting it and after that you have checked it with the answer key but still you need to, uh, your uh, NTA decides to send you the OMR and you have to cross check again. So you still have a chance right. So much in the same way so the kidney also has another chance to reconsider its decision so that is in the DCT. So even now your body is in a crisis so that it needs more water and you are not drinking enough water. So what does it do? So your kidney gets a signal from the pituitary gland to say we need to conserve water so reabsorb whatever remaining water you have in the filtrate because when it is coming out of the descending limb it is diluted right which means you can still absorb water. So this is on a conditional basis based on a command from the pituitary gland the master endocrine gland so the water is being reabsorbed from the DCT. So this is called as conditional reabsorption. So you would have heard about one hormone that is ADH. So, this is anti-diuretic hormone. So, this is also known as vasopressin. So, these hormones are released from the neurohypophysis that is the posterior pituitary which acts on the DCT so that it can still reabsorb water sodium. So, this has conditional reabsorption of water and Na+. Apart from that, DCT also plays a role in tubular secretion. So, it secretes H+, K+, and ammonia into the filtrate. Fine? Yes? So, this is done. So, I guess PCT, loop of Henle and DCT is done and you guys have no doubts. So, moving to the last one that is the collecting duct. So, this is the collecting duct, right? So, what do you know about the collecting duct? So, collecting duct, so I write it in short form as CD. So, collecting duct extends from the cortex of the kidney. So, to the medullary region.
right? So it helps in maximum reabsorption of water. So it also forms a passage for the reabsorption of urea from the medullary interstitium. That is the medullary region, right? So that is the function of the collecting duct. So this is the collecting duct. So it extends from the cortex region till the medulla and it helps in maximum reabsorption of water. And to some extent, it also allows the passage of urea into the medullary intestinium. So this region, this is the medullary intestinum. So which means the medullary fluid. So here it helps in the concentration or it helps in the passage of urea. So with this all the functions of the tubules are done. So now we are going to see how all of this help in concentrating the urine. So concentrating the urine is a responsibility that is bestowed with the kidney so that your body can conserve the little water, right? Suppose you are here busy. So now I am taking class, right? So it will not be nice if I go to my place, pick up my water bottle, drink water. Suppose say I forgot to bring a water bottle inside right so now i will not be able to go out there and drink because it's a live session that's going on right so that is not really good so now i have to speak for another 20 minutes though i am very thirsty right so now it's the time that my body has to conserve water right so it cannot uh, lose or it cannot make an expense to lose water so that is the reason your kidney has to conserve or uh, so in conserving water it is trying to concentrate the urine so now let's talk about how the urine is getting concentrated. Yes, ma'am, a very, very happy good evening. So thank you for joining us today. So please do like, share and subscribe. Okay. So moving forward, so mechanism of concentration of urine. So why it is done? So I have told you by now multiple times to conserve water, right? But how it is done? So that is the question and that is what we are going to talk about. So that is the entire topic. So before that, I had to give you some prerequisites. So that is why we're talking about the functions of the tubule. So now, what is countercurrent mechanism? So when you talk about the medullary region of your uh, nephron, that is the juxta medullary nephron, so you have two parallel tubes. So one is lupo Henle, the other one is vasa recta. So lupo Henle and vasa recta, they just lie parallel to each other, right? So that is how it is. So let's see. Okay, so let me draw it for you. So let's say this is loop of Henle. So this is loop of Henle. So the filtrate is coming down, it's going up. So this is the descending limb, this is the ascending limb, right? So now let me draw the Vasa rector. So suppose, please bear with my diagram, suppose this is vasa recta, so it is YC versa. So this is the descending limb and this is the ascending limb. So this is the descending limb, this is the ascending limb. So one more thing that you have to understand, what flows inside the loop of Henle is the filtrate. So what flows inside vasa recta is your blood because it is a, a branch of your capillary. It is a branch or a, a part of your peritubular capillaries, right? So what flows inside is the blood and here what flows inside is the filtrate. Yes, you agree? Yes, so this is the prerequisite I want you to have. Now these are the two players that's going to help us concentrate the urine. So now you're going to see how. So now what is this term? Uh, uh, so before that, so what is this term? Countercurrent mechanism. So if you see, though these two are parallel, but the flow is different in each case, right? So the flow inside the loop of Henle is different because this is the descending limb, but here this is the ascending limb. The flow or the direction of flow is different. Suppose I walk from here to there, but let's say Supriya is walking from there to here. So we are clashing each other. We are exactly opposite. So the flow inside the loop of Henle and Vasa recta is opposite, right? So that is called this countercurrent mechanism. Fine? Yes. So this countercurrent mechanism is going to help us concentrate urine. So first you have to remember these are the two players. One is loop of Henle, the other one is vasa recta. So what flows inside the loop of Henle is the filtrate and what flows inside the vasa recta is the blood, right? And we also understand the flow is in the opposite direction. So we call this as the countercurrent mechanism. So now moving forward, so how exactly does it happen? So this is loop of Henle or the Henle's loop and this is the vasa recta, right? 
So this is the cortex region of the kidney and this is the medullary region, right? So this is the innermost region. So the innermost region has more concentration of ions and fluids. So its concentration is pretty high. So I measure the concentration in terms of osmolarity, right? So I say osmotic fluid, so I measure in terms of osmolarity. So in the medullary region, so I have 1200 milli osmolarity per liter. But in the cortex region, I have only 300 milli osmolarity per liter. So which means there is a gradient that is set up, right? So gradient is a difference. Just like we saw in breathing and exchange of gas, there is a gradient between the pressure inside the lungs and in that of the atmosphere. So similarly, since there is a difference here, there is a gradient that's being set up, right? So how is this gradient being set up or who helps in this gradient? So that is your loop of Henle and your vasa recta. How? So there are two things. One is because of your NaCl and the other one is because of the urea. So how are these going to help us establish the gradient? So let's see. So this is your descending loop of Henle. Yes. So this is permeable to water. Fine. And this is impermeable to electrolytes. But when the electrolyte comes to this side, that is the ascending limb, this is permeable to electrolyte. So the NaCl comes out. So NaCl is coming out from the ascend, uh, ascending limb of Henle. The NaCl that comes out of the ascending limb of Henle is collected by the descending limbs of the Vasa recta. Because this is exactly superimposed here or you can say it is exactly parallel, right? So, if the NaCl comes out, that is collected by the flow of blood inside the vasa recta. So, once again, it concentrates in this region, right? So, much in the same way. So, if you remember, I told you when I was explaining collecting that, that it also allows the passage of urea in the intestinium, right? So, this urea which comes out of the collecting duct again enters the vasa recta or the loop of Henle, thus concentrating the medullary interstitium. So, the more and more ions get concentrated, so the water is, beca the water is becoming less. So, the urine that is getting formed is getting concentrated. So, maximum water is reabsorbed in the DCT, right? So, everything is reabsorbed, but still we have to keep concentrating. Right? So, we, we put more amount of filtrate here. So, medullary region, we keep it concentrated so that whatever remaining water is there, so that goes out and it is reabsorbed in the DCT. So, that is how the urine is concentrated. So, did you understand? So, how the urine is concentrated with the help of countercurrent mechanism of the loop of Henle and Vasa recta? How? There is a gradient that is set up between the osmolar concentration between the medulla and the cortex and who establishes this gradient that is the NaCl and the urea, right? So, did you get this right? Come on, give me a response. Yes, the gradient is set up by NaCl and urea. So, did you guys understand the entire concept? Was it easy? So, what are we left with in this topic is what is mictrusion, the process of release of urine. So, how are we going to release urine and what are the characteristics of urine and who regulates this? So, are there any other mechanism, any other mechanisms or hormones which is regulating this? So, that is the topic for tomorrow. Okay, so thank you Supriya for your response. So, you said it is clear. So, thank you. So, this is one concept that students get confused, but it is very simple. All you need to remember is three points. Vasa recta, lupo Henle. So, point number two, you have to remember it is a, a countercurrent mechanism. And three, you have to remember it maintains a gradient, that the gradient is established by your NaCl and your urea. Right? Done? Okay, so that is all I want to talk in today's class. So, tomorrow we will continue with mictrusion, the process of release of urine and the regulation of the kidney function. So, once again, the summary of this entire chapter. So, we spoke about the human kidney, the structure of the human kidney. So, we also spoke about the structure of the nephron, which are the structural and functional units of the kidney. So, the main function of the kidney is to prepare or form urine. So, we spoke about the three steps that is involved in the mechanism of formation of urine. So, we also have renal tubules. So, we spoke about the function of the renal tubules. So, which includes PCT, DCT, loop of Henle and the collecting duct. So, finally, we spoke how the urine can be concentrated. 
So this is our root map till now. So till this we are done for today. So tomorrow we'll continue further. So this is all I want to talk in today's class. I hope you enjoyed my class and I hope you understood out of everything. So thank you so much for connecting with me every day. So without any fail. So I'm really grateful for all your support. So I really feel very privileged and very honored and very excited to connect with you every day. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So please continue to like, share and subscribe. So this is me wishing you more and most. So see you tomorrow at 5.15. So until then, bye and take care.